of what a privilege it is to gather together this day and proclaim that God is good, God is true, and we are joyful in the Lord in all things. So as we begin, we continue with Scripture. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5-7. through 7. You follow along and let's get our hearts and our minds calibrated heavenward. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge and of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Thanks be to God. So let us sing of that light that shines from us, that heavenly sunlight. It's hymn number 424. Stand together, let's sing. Ben, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Would you sing praises to your neighbor and thank them for being in worship with you today? If you're worshiping with us by way of television or live stream, however you're worshiping, we are so thankful for you. We count you as a part of our family. What's happening here is happening in your home. So we rejoice with that. Thank you for making worship a priority and welcome to First Baptist. God bless. <laughs> Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. We're grateful that you were able to worship with us. Those that are worshiping in the room with us today, it is good. And we're grateful for all of you watching on television this morning and worshiping with us in that way. We're grateful that you can. Now, if you're new or guest uh, with us in the room, we would love for you to take one of these cards. It looks like this. Um, there should be one in the pew back uh, in front of you. If you take that and put your name on it and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service, we would love to get to know you and your name. And this is how we do that. Now, similarly, for those watching on television this morning, we have a card online. If you go to our website, fbcsa.org, there should be a connect button at the top of the page where you can fill one of these out, and we'd like to get to know you as well. Now, this week, we have been reading together all week long, as we do, Nehemiah chapter 1. And I hope you were reminded of one of the distinct calls of Scripture on our church is to be a repentant people where we recognize that we are people who are broken and have been broken. We have fallen into the traps of sin, and we know the mercy of God out of those temptations. And so we pray together that we will be repentant as God reveals sin, and we'll say, Father, forgive us. And so we'll see that in Nehemiah, and we pray that we know that all through our worship today. So as we sing, as we read, as we pray, we hope the Lord will bring to mind those sins that need to be repented of and you'll be faithful in that and say, Father, forgive me. Let's pray together. Lord, every one of us in this place have known deep brokenness Lord, every, every one of us have fallen into temptations we shouldn't have. And Lord, we pray for your forgiveness. Father, we pray that your Spirit would come and heal. We flip through the pages of Scripture and we read of a God of mercy. Lord, we pray that this morning you would speak from your mercy seat. And that compassion would fill this place. Lord, that we would not be burdened with unshakable guilt. But that we would be set free by the grace that was found at the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we, we pray that in this place you would help us to experience that today. By your Spirit, bring freedom. Lord, help us to know your grace. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
It is good to be home. It's good to be with you. I miss you when I'm gone. I miss your worship. I miss your hearts. I miss your smiling faces. Cue smiling faces. Okay, yeah. (laughs) It really is a joy. Thanks for allowing me to be gone. Not everybody takes a vacation to ride their bicycle 500 miles, but you know, it's what I do. So we're going to continue in our worship through uh, Scripture. And as we've been reading all week long about Nehemiah, one of my favorite Old Testament characters, um, as he looks over a destroyed Jerusalem, and his pastor is going to preach on repentance, uh, it's always good to, to, to frame that against John's vision of a restored, completed, new holy city. So you follow along as I read from Revelation 21, verse 10 to 14, and then I'll jump to 22 and 23. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north. And three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Thanks be to God. Continuing our worship through congregational singing now. Hymn 466, our prayer, send a great revival. Stand together, let's sing.
Amen. As you're seated, children, come meet me down on the steps. We've got a couple of things that I want to show you today. Come on down, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, come on down. All right. It's good to see you all this morning. Come down, everybody. Ooh, I got poked by something. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Come on down. You still got time. Come on down, everybody. You're good. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I've got two things that I'm going to show you. All right. It's in the box. Now, here's thing number one. Don't, don't look. Don't cheat. All right, here we go. All right, now, here is, he, here is something. All right, I'm going to get this. It's a Lego set. Now, my daughters are at their grandparents. They're not here today. But I went to my daughter's room, and this, this Lego set, uh, something has happened. What has happened here? Can, can you, yeah, it, oh, and I just broke off another piece, right? So I think this is supposed to be down. Oh, and I think there's another piece in the box here. So this, this Lego set is all falling apart, right? So if, if the Lego set is all falling apart like that, what do I need to do? Put it back together. Yeah, put it back together. How do I know how to put it back together? I don't, what, what do you think? Okay, I need to find the instructions. If I can't find the instructions, what do I do? Yeah, the, and just, I don't know. I think I can find ways to fit it on there, right, to make it. Oh, no, that fell off again. Oh, no, I'm losing another piece. All right, well, let me show you something else. Yeah, put that back in the box here. Now, let me show you this. There's something that happened to this, too. Oh, no. Whoa, oh, my goodness. What happened to this? It got burned. Oh, it did. It got burned. What is this? It's a fire. It is. It is a fire. It got burned. What happened? Do you might know? It, it's a, it, is, it is a Build-A-Bear box, and there, there wasn't a Build-A-Bear in there that caught on fire. Or, or actually, I set it on fire. Um, <laughs> it, now, what, now, what would I do to fix this? So I know how to fix the Legos, right? The Legos, I can put it all back together. Get new what do I do with this? I would, just, I would just have to get a new one? Is there any way to fix it? You wow. just had to, you just had to like, put glue on it. Uh, I can glue some more cardboard, maybe? Yeah, so I don't know. So I, I want you to listen carefully. I'm going to put this back up because it does kind of stink, doesn't it? Ugh. Ugh, I know. It smells like smoke. All right, so I want you to pay attention. So in the sermon today, I want you to listen because we're reading Nehemiah. And Nehemiah says a couple of things about Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem is broken. It's a city and the walls are broken down. And he talks about the gates of the city being burned. And so when he comes to this city... And everything is broken. He has to do something. And the first thing he does when things are broken and burned is he goes straight to God. And he starts to pray. And so I want you to know that in your own life too. And listen, listen for how Nehemiah does that in the sermon today. But I also want you to know that when your life feels broken, when you feel that you have been burned, the best place to go first is always to God. To get on your knees and say, God, help me. And he's going to help you. Because there's all kinds of things that we can't fix. Like that Build-A-Bear box. I can't fix that, can I? But God can fix anything. And it doesn't matter what we face in this life. God can fix it. So let's pray and we'll go. Lord, we thank you for being our redeemer, our restorer, a God who can fix anything. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us together to come to you with everything so that we would know your restoration. And Lord, we pray for each one of these students, Lord, that they would know your spirit and the restoring power that you bring from heaven. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank y'all. <laughs> Keep working on that. Continue our worship, everybody. Find in your hymnals or your worship bulletins hymn number 308, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Let's stand together as we sing.
The song we're about to sing, uh, we commissioned uh, a few years ago. I, I hate to tell you the year is 2020. Good things did come out of that year, I promise you. One of the things we did in that season is we commissioned the, the piece of art that is in Great Hall and three pieces of music based on the church-wide theme of repent, witness, and disciple. You're going to hear this, this first movement of, of that um, triptych of music. And it takes a familiar hymn text, Open my eyes that I may see. And it also weaves in there the word metanoia. It's one of the words of repentance that you find throughout Scripture, the idea of turning away from what used to be to where God wants you to be. So as we prepare to hear the word this morning, just hear these words, receive them, and worship with us as we think about repentance and our need for it. If you would, find in your listening sheet this portion of our reverse from this week, Nehemiah 1, 3 through 9. We're going to read this aloud together. 
Now, for the week's reading, we've been reading the entire chapter, but for this time today, we'll read Nehemiah 1, 3 through 9. So if you would, stand with me and let's read this aloud together. This, then, is the text for today. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who perseveres the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. May God bless the reading of his word. Nehemiah found himself in the most comfortable of circumstances. About as good as you could have in those days. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. Though he was not from Susa, which was the winter capital of the Persian Empire, this is what he knew. And it was a distant land that was forced onto his family ages ago. But now this is where he was. It's where he lived and worked for King Artaxerxes, cupbearer to the king. Now, this role that Nehemiah was in as cupbearer certainly had its perils. This was the role that was the taste tester. He is the one who would taste the wine before the king would have it so that they would know if that wine had been poisoned. So there could come a day then where Nehemiah would have to give his life for the king. But this role, cupbearer to the king, came with unparalleled access. You see, this role for Nehemiah meant that he was always with the king. He was always near the king. He always knew what was going on in the kingdom. Nehemiah was as close to power as you could be without being the king himself which gave Nehemiah leverage and opportunity that people could only dream of. You know, and as that stands, being in such a role, most of us would be completely enamored with that throne. Most of the time, most of us would be comfortable with such good fortune. Nehemiah, though, was unsettled. In fact, as as our text begins today in Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah wept. The the Spirit of God had been working in his heart in, in such a way that Nehemiah was not satisfied with the sheen of a Persian palace. Most of us, most of the time, are satisfied with the sheen of this world. But the Spirit of God had come upon Nehemiah and that no longer held sway over him. Nehemiah now longed for his ancestral home, Jerusalem. And so where he is in this role in our text this week, Nehemiah calls for a report from home. Say, give me a report of Jerusalem. How does she look? 
How does she feel? You see, he's not worried about Susa's growth. He's not worried about the Persian Empire. His heart longs for home. And the report that he got back was that the people were broken. The walls were in ruins. And the gates charred by flames. You see, Nehemiah did not care that he had meals fit for a king. He he no longer found comfort in the pillow that he was able to lay his head on every night. His heart was set on Jerusalem. You see, that that report that, that Israel was still captives, broken to their core, That report that that the, the, the city of Jerusalem was still charred rubble. I mean, there were still, there were people there. There were people that had come back and they, they were starting to make things work in and around the temple. But the nation was a disaster. They had been for a couple of centuries. And Nehemiah wept. When he heard of the state of Jerusalem, his heart was broken. And so he wept and he mourned and he fasted. He prayed for months. He prayed about this. See, God had given Nehemiah this this heart from home. But it just led to lament. He was he was hurting. And, and out of that lament, as, as Nehemiah is hearing these reports, and as Nehemiah is on his knees, he, he, he's praying, God showed him this vision of something greater. That, that God, God was saying to Nehemiah, there is something greater in store for the people of God. That the, the people of God have something set for them in the future that's greater than what they see today. And though Jerusalem is rubble, God is a God who restores. You know, we have to wonder and ask the question, how did the people of God get into this way? If God is a restorer, if God has things better, if God has other things intended and available to the people of God, how does Jerusalem end up in ruins? How, how, do, how do generations of people end up in exile away from their homes? How could this happen to the people of God? One of the things that you have to work through as you turn through the pages of the Old Testament is that this is so, not because the people of God were martyrs of a broken world. The people of God, the children of Israel, were victims of their own disobedience. This is what the prophets are about. So the book of Jeremiah is about. Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Ezekiel. All of these books are about this very fact. That the wrath of God was real upon his children. And that this is punishment for their sin. As you you look through all those prophets. You you read through these these books like like Jeremiah. You see some themes of the the children of Israel that led to this point of disrepair. It says that nearly everyone was living for themselves. Nearly everyone did not care at all about who God was or what God was doing. No one cared what God had said in the past. No one sought God's voice anymore. Not even their pastors, their shepherds, their priests. They didn't care what God had to say to their day. The whole country, God's people, were done with God. And this played out in their everyday lives. There were all kinds of repercussions of this. So we just come to how Jeremiah describes it. We're in and around, somewhere around 600 B.C., and, and we hear these, these same repetitions. Everyone was a liar. No one cared about anything other than themselves. Adultery was normal. Stealing was normal. Murder was normal. 
No one cared that they were cheating their neighbor because everybody assumed their neighbor had been cheating them. And so that's one layer. So the prophets tell us another layer of this is as all of this is happening, everybody kept telling themselves that it's all okay and it's all going to be okay. They kept saying everything is fine with us. And as they kept saying, everything is fine with us, the anger of God rises to an unimaginable peak. The the people of Israel cannot fathom that Jerusalem will be rubble. But God said, if you keep acting the way you're acting, Jerusalem will be rubble. Jeremiah says over and over again, God's people started to worship other things. God's people started to worship other gods. And just as bad as worshiping other gods, God's people began to to worship their own hands. They were worshiping themselves and, and all of the things that their hands had done. So one of the examples of this is they they stopped saying that Israel was the promised land of God. Because that would mean it came from God. As history moved forward, they lost that sentiment. And they said, this land is our land. It was their land instead of God's land. One of the ways that Scripture describes this says that Israel was chasing the imagination of their evil hearts. See, I don't think we realize how often the pain in our lives is caused by the imagination of our evil hearts. We like to blame them, or we like to blame somebody else, or we like to bring, blame Satan and his minions. We like to blame God. But regularly and often, the pain that's brought into our lives is, is brought in because we're chasing the imagination of our evil hearts. That they're not listening, they're not caring, the oh, it's going to be all right. When we, we grin and bear sin like it's a cold to get over. This is chasing down our imagination of our evil hearts that leads straight into exile each and every time. That, that is the warning of the Old Testament over and over again. The prophets shouting from the rooftops, the imagination of your evil hearts leads into exile. For Israel, there there were signs all around them of this depravity. It seems as though the most striking one for Nehemiah, though, and, and what caused Nehemiah to weep was the present state of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been left in ruins. The walls were broken down, the gates burned with fire. Now, there were, there were people there living in and around but, but it was nothing like the vibrant capital city that it used to be. And he was mourning. The, Jerusalem was just a scar. It was, it was like it was a scar left over from the war. And Nehemiah hears and he weeps. He's not weeping because of some stones that are overturned. He's weeping because what this represented. The the state of Jerusalem in the Old Testament directly reflected the spiritual state of God's children. The city was broken because the people were broken. And out of this, I want you to recognize what Nehemiah does. When he hears of this state of disrepair in in, in Jerusalem, but but also in the hearts of God's people, he, he doesn't run and grab a hammer and some nails and take off to Jerusalem. His first thought wasn't, I need to fix this. His initial reaction was to pray, to seek the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm grateful where we are in this study in general because it's typically not what we think of when we think of Nehemiah. When we think of Nehemiah, typically in the church, we think about a man who gets things done. A man who rebuilds the walls. Fixing the city. 
That's not where Nehemiah begins. That's not where his strength and his wisdom came from. He, he begins in months of prayer. And, and I want you to note in particular the, the prayer that begins this book. Th- these are prayers of repentance from Nehemiah on behalf of himself and his family and his people. He says, Lord, forgive us. Now the normal fleshly response is to, to point fingers and assign blame. But, but Nehemiah here, chapter 1, says, Lord, we have sinned. Me and my family, we are sinful. That we have sinned against God for hundreds of years. Father, forgive us. You know, this is the posture that God has called the First Baptist San, uh, Church of San Antonio to take. The posture that, that God has in store for us. Is that we be a repentant people, a people who know what it means to be in confession, a people that knows what it means to practice repentance. And and I want you to to notice with me, this call to repentance of our Lord is throughout the Scriptures. From the Old Testament into the New, Jesus is, is calling, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right, when you come to Jesus' ministry in the Gospels, the first of the Gospels, Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, it says Jesus begins his ministry and the first thing Jesus says in his ministry is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same thing happens when we get to Pentecost as we move to the birth of the early church and, and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the church. Acts 2, it says the, the Spirit of God comes upon the church and, and Peter preaches this sermon to this large gathered crowd. And, and as they gather and they hear the sermon, they say, Peter, what do we do? And what does he tell them to do? He says, repent. Same thing when we get to Acts 26 and the, the Apostle Paul is before King Agrippa. And King Agrippa says, you, you have been turning the world upside down. What are you preaching? What are you saying to be so disruptive in our communities? And he looks at King Agrippa and he says, I preach that all people everywhere should repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. As you keep working through the, the, the New Testament, we get to the, the book of Revelation. And Revelation begins and, and it's Jesus speaking. And it says he has a word for seven churches. And as the book of Revelation begins, it says the word to five of those seven churches is repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, we as individuals and we as a church have sinned to be repented of. But the message of the Christ is that there is mercy and grace and compassion that flow out of the throne room of heaven. You see, we, we recognize that there is rubble all around us. And, and I want you to, to, to notice, th- this is the work of the Spirit. As the, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the brokenness of this world, the rubble that's in our hearts, the rubble that's in our lives, the rubble that's in this country, the rubble that's in this world, the, the Spirit of God reveals to us the rubble And our response is to be repentant. It's like Nehemiah falling on his knees and be repentant. Because we know that there is something greater available. There is something greater to the children of God. There is something greater in store that's in front of us. See, Nehemiah prays for forgiveness. And it leads to the restoration of Jerusalem. But in Revelation, we see this story. You see the, the... five of the seven churches Jesus says to repent as we move through the book of Revelation and, and we see the glory and majesty of our God something, something beautiful happens and as you, you come to the end the last two chapters of the Bible the last two chapters uh, of Revelation John looks up and there is this beautiful holy heavenly Jerusalem a new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven that is, that is perfect and pure. It is free from sin. It is free from pain. It is free from death. And God said, I have this in store for you. My glory for my people. That is what I intend for you. It was pretty remarkable how, how Jesus 
worked with his disciples as he walked towards the cross. If you, if you remember and, and think back with me in that Passion Week, as Jesus is, is preparing his disciples for the crucifixion, he gives them a word of comfort. And, and his word of comfort in John is he says to them, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. You see, af- after the crucifixion, there's, I'm going to ascend into heaven. And as I ascend, then the Holy Spirit will come down upon you, the church. But as I ascend and go up, I will prepare a place for you. A place that is good and right and holy. A, a place that is free from the burdens of sin and the pain of this life. And know what I have in store for you is restoration. A God who restores by his mercy. So let us be a repentant people. That when we recognize the rubble of this earth and the rubble of our lives, may we fall to our knees in repentance and say, Lord, forgive us. So that we might see and know the heavenly city of Jerusalem. A city not of this world, but of the people of God. Illuminated by His glory and Him alone. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray this morning that Your Spirit would lead us into repentance so that we might know your restoration. Lord, we we pray that you would help us to stop fixing ourselves and trust the Spirit. Lord, bring this restoration. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come in our lives. Lord, we we pray that by the power of your Spirit, we would be made new. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to have a a time of response now. And and we we hope that every one of you will respond to the Lord in some way. Um, let Let me offer this. that The altar, the steps are open for prayer. Come forward and pray prayers of repentance. Come forward and pray prayers of thanksgiving for the grace of God. Um, I, I'm going to be down front on this side. Pastor Brian will be down front over here. Come pray with us. We, we want to pray with you in that way too. If you want to pray about accepting Christ, if God's working on your heart, we want to know. We, we want to pray with you in that way. If you want to be a part of this church, we want to we pray for you in that way. So come down. We're going to sing. We're going to give. But this is your time to, to respond to the Lord. And so as he calls, you be faithful. Uh, If you need to, you can remain seated. The rest of us, let's stand as we respond.
Good morning, church family. This is an exciting day for us. It is a, a huge day that we love to celebrate around here in First Kids, uh, where we get to give out new Bibles to our incoming kindergartners. Uh, and so we have a lot of families today that are being blessed with a new Bible and a lot of kids that are being encouraged to read God's Word. And so, uh, families, if you are one of those kiddos or parents of those kiddos that are taking part in the kindergarten presentation, you guys can move forward right now and come Come up close if you like. Um, that way it'll save you the long walk as I'm reading names like graduation. But it is a, an important day for us. Um, everything that we do is centered on God's word. Uh, the, the Lord's word never changes. Uh, and we want the kids to know that, that as they go into kindergarten, uh, as they learn to read, that this is the most important book that they will ever read. Uh, that, that this is where the foundation of our love and our joy and our peace comes from. Uh, and so we want to encourage them with that. And so as they go into kindergarten, uh, we love to give them their very first Bible from our church. And so we've got over, tw- uh, we've got 24 Bibles that we are handing out today through all of our services and about 14 in here. And so this is a, an exciting day for us. Uh, so kids, When I say your name, you're going to get your Bible from Pastor Chris. He's going to hand it to you. And then you guys can come and stand on the top step right over here. And we're going to take lots of pictures of you, okay? So get your smiles ready. All right. So our first one who actually can't be here today is Mary Bone. Mary Bone is going to be coming into kindergarten. Uh, Malia Colazzo. Where are you, Malia? Come on 